Yeah, so through, um, you know, you've talked about earlier, um, you know, when you were younger, you kind of had the option to do either cricket or tennis. Um, you chose the tennis route. Um, can you tell me about your early tennis career and kind of how it all started for you? Well, um, I obviously had the, the talent. And so having made the decision to, with, with uh, parental backing, father's backing particularly, um, decided against university. So after finishing my schooling, the equivalent of A-levels here in South Africa, I spent a year really catching up with other uh, people of my age because mm -hmm. my talent would show itself, but it would only show itself uh, from time to time because I was away at boarding school, played a lot of cricket, played a lot of other sport and uh, needed to catch up with the other other players of my age so I spent a year concentrating on tennis working out with uh, a coach and um, after a year of doing that decided to to travel mm. and um, my first couple of years were spent mainly in England playing small tournaments uh, playing Wimbledon generally having to qualify for Wimbledon but that was fairly common uh, firstly, I wasn't good enough to get straight in, and secondly, even people like Leva before me had had to qualify at times to get into Wimbledon. Mm. So uh, it was just a matter of of an serving an apprenticeship, going around playing as many tournaments as I possibly could in the European summer, and uh, then going back to South Africa in the South African summer and playing tournaments down there. So for about the first eight, uh, nine, ten years of my life, I d had no winter. Mm. Would come over to Britain and stay and play in the first two or three years mainly in Britain. After that, it was a combination of British tournaments and European tournaments on the continent, yeah. and then go back to South Africa, and where South Africa had a thriving tennis circuit of its own. Mm. Mm. And, and you just talked about your early career there. But where did kind of your big break come in tennis? Because it, you mentioned you were qualifying in the, for Wimbledon, you played at Wimbledon. But where was the kind of match or the moment that kind of kick started it all for you? Yes. Well, it, it's interesting to to even dwell for, uh, back on why I, I might have chosen tennis rather than cricket. And even there, there was a sort of a, a breakthrough. Uh, I won the just out of the blue. Won the South African junior doubles title and uh, that sort of uh, gave me uh, perhaps an even greater incentive than I had in cricket mm. so later on when uh, it reached a stage of of uh, having been on the circuit for four or five years uh, doing my apprenticeship one of my goals was to represent South Africa Davis Cup Mm. And I had achieved what I thought was necessary to play Davis Cup. I'd won two South African titles, mm. and yet they still kept me out of the team. Mm. So I needed uh, I needed a break, and the break came in the form of a South African Davis, team, Davis Cup team that was doing all right, but found that by overlooking me, they were short of a really good doubles player, and I was co-opted not by the national selectors but by our Davis Cup manager and also by other members of the South African team who virtually insisted that they yeah. were short yeah. of somebody like me and they had me join the Davis Cup team in the middle of a campaign yeah. over in, in Europe because at that stage South Africa played all its Davis Cup matches away from home in Europe yeah. and they co-opted me the, to the team. My first match was against uh, the French at Roland Garros was very successful and from then on my thoughts of giving up tennis because I wasn't didn't seem to be getting anywhere remember this was in the amateur days there wasn't a great deal of money in the game I wasn't getting into the Davis Cup team now suddenly I was in the team I was successful and I then decided to continue to stick at tennis rather than go back go to university or something like that mm. 
feel free to, to <laughs> eBay. Sure, I think. Carry on. Um, yeah, one thing that fascinates me about you as a player um, is, is the style you played. Um, obviously, off both wings, you mm -hmm. were double handed. Yeah. And rarely in the game we see that now. Maybe the one exception would be um, Fabrice Santoro, yeah. uh, who's now retired. Um, but do you think, how, how did you come to be both hands off both wings? And could you see a player using that technique thriving now? Or do you think that technique's kind of found out of the game? Well, the, the reason I think I um, stuck to two hands on both sides was that because I played a lot of cricket and other sports, but mainly cricket, tennis for me was almost a, a seasonal game. And had I had I been in a a situation where I was exposed to coaches and uh, advice from people other than, say, my father, I would probably have switched to a single-handed game. As it was, even when I left school at uh, 17, 18, uh, my father and I mm -hmm. did try and uh, see whether a single-handed game was going to be me. Yeah. And I quite successfully for a couple of months played single-handed tennis, no tournaments, but was just practicing it, working on the single-handed game. But in the end I decided that at the age of 18, even though I hadn't played tennis day in and day out, somehow a single-handed game just wasn't me. It didn't, yeah. Didn't, yeah. didn't befit my nature. Mm. So I turfed that end and continued to play the two-handed game. The reason, of course, for two hands was that I was probably three or four when I first picked up a racket. But I was the youngest of three sons. My older brothers played. My both my parents played. So it was natural that I would pick up a racket, and I inevitably picked up their racket. The racket was too heavy, and I just played with two hands on on both sides. As a result, can um, a player do it today? Yes, they can. They can never be. Um, ultra successful at singles there mm. because it is a fact I reached a, a, a major quarterfinal, the quarterfinal of the US Open mm. and a number of other double handed on both sides reached quarterfinals but yeah. nobody mm. in the men's game ever got beyond the quarterfinal mm. of a major event and uh, two reasons for it, firstly two hands on both sides it restricts your reach tremendously yeah. Yeah. and um, Secondly, it would be probably that much more difficult for somebody today other than perhaps somebody of Del Potro's size mm. or Isner's size who played two hands on both sides because they would at least have a fair amount of reach. Yeah. But with all the power that there is in the game, yeah, I think it's becoming more and more difficult for people with two hands on both sides to thrive mm. because of that disadvantage. Of course, it was possible in the women's game, the greatest exponent of it was Sellers. Yeah. who won majors but she's the only double-handed player on both sides ever mm. to win majors yeah. and it's not likely to happen in the women's game no. now be either because of the power mm. Mm. and, and um, your career uh, as a doubles player you've had a lot of ex success um, in mixed doubles and men's doubles um, five title grand slam titles in each yeah um, Let's talk about the Wimbledon ones. You won that three times. Um, the first one, am I correct in saying you won it in 1969? 67. 67, sorry. Yeah. The next one was 72. Yeah. And the next one was 78. Right, spot on. And between them, that's quite a gap. Mm -hmm. um, you know, does that, do you think, sh showed the kind of longevity of your doubles play? But what was it like, you know, winning the Wimbledon title? Because you know, arguably, yeah, for a tennis player, that, that's probably the pinnacle. That's the dream, uh, particularly for anybody from uh, the Commonwealth countries, South Africa, Australia, particularly, uh, because we produced a lot of players at that stage, don't do so now. Mm. But the dream for us all was to, to succeed at Wimbledon because it was what came threw to us on the radio. We had no television in those days. And as a result, players before me in South Africa who succeeded, did well at Wimbledon, yeah. really looked up to 
and therefore it became our ambition really to succeed at Wimbledon. So consequently, as the first South African to win a men's doubles title at Wimbledon, it, yeah. it was a real feather in my cap and something of which I was immensely proud then and something of which I'm pretty proud now. Yeah. There were South African players who had won mixed doubles titles. Eric Sturgis, who was probably the greatest South African player of all time, and one of my childhood heroes. Yeah. Another incidentally was Dennis Compton, okay, a childhood yeah. hero of mine. Mm. Um, but yes, winning Wimbledon was, was a dream, and doing it, I suppose, so many years apart, in some ways it was terrific, but I would love there to have been many more successes, mm. uh, you know, between 67 and 78. And um, in particular, uh, your doubles partnership, in men's doubles, is with Bob Hewitt. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that partnership and, and what was it that made it work for you? Was it kind of a click between you off the court or, or do you think it was something on the court or, or was it a good friendship? In our case, Bob Hewitt was an Australian who married a South African, came to be based in South Africa. National associations get a lot of stick as a rule. Mm and uh, the South African Association probably at times were to blame as well but the one very good thing they did as far as my career was concerned yeah. was they actually asked Hewitt and me to get together mm. um, and uh, as a result uh, we, we teamed up the chap I'd been playing with before was beginning to sort of fade a bit as a talent Hewitt had already succeeded and uh, the first time we played together we clicked and uh, we won our first 45 straight matches without being beaten. Um, won Wimbledon the first year we played together. So it was obviously a, a, a partnership made in heaven, just a, a good blend of people who understood the doubles game, who could read the doubles game very well. I suppose I had to slightly adjust my game to his because Bob was uh, chiefly a touch player, had power, but uh, had he had more power, he would have been a great success in singles as well, because he was multi-talented. But I probably had to develop a little bit more power to make the partnership successful. So, in some ways, where before I'd been much more the sort of player that he mm -hmm. was, using a lot more touch and angles and subtleties, I had to develop a, a slightly more powerful game, which I think I did. And as a result, the sort of blend of power and and uh, terrific touch, power and, and subtlety, delicacy, uh, I think made us into a, a pretty formidable combination. Mm. And just taking things on as well, I'm looking at the Grand Slam tournaments there. Um, I think arguably Grand Slams weren't as uh, a bigger fixture in the, in the tennis calendar then. Um, um, would I be right in saying the surfaces were similar in respects in terms of hard course? Um, at some of them, did that? What, what was it like to play at the four different Grand Slams? Then, or some some people didn't even play the Australian. Well, we didn't play the Australian. No. We never <coughs> never played there, so it's obviously lacking in in um, my records. Um, and the reason being, as, as you're uh, suggesting, that the, the majors were important, but it was really the, the uh, Wimbledon that was ultra important to us. Mm. A lot of people didn't even go to the US Open, or the US Championships as they were originally called. And um, after 1973, I didn't play the French again, even though my career extended until the 80s. I didn't play the French after 73. Okay. Whereas I played Wimbledon every, yeah. every year. Um, so consequently, some of the, the, the records of the earlier players could have been, including ourselves, in terms of the accumulation of major titles, would have been far greater mm -hmm. had we played many more of them. Even people like Connors and Borg, for instance, didn't play the Australian much at all. Yeah. Connors uh, didn't play the French. He, one year he won three three majors in one year, but didn't play the French. So in fact, might have actually 
mm. won the Grand Slam, yeah. you know, the four majors in one year. So the majors have become much more uh, important to the players, particularly the, the Australian, mm. which many of us uh, overlooked. Now, of course, it's, it's a much stronger test. If you look at the earlier records of the Australians, it was a, the Australian, it was dominated by Australian players. Mm. And then in some of the Davis Cup matches were played in Australia because it was the challenge round of the Davis Cup and the Australians and the Americans tended to dominate the earlier years of the Davis Cup so with the challenge round everybody played through to challenge the team that had won the previous year so the Americans would reach the final and a few of the American players might play in the Australian championships but no more than that mm -hmm. now it's become a much more uh, solid and international field Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and you mentioned some of the Australian players there. Obviously, Lever is, is a you know a household name in tennis, a legend of the game. Uh, Roy Emerson as well. Um, how, what, who is the best player you've played against, or the best player you've seen, and and how would you compare him to the players that have, that, that are today? Obviously, with Federer as a player that I've grown up and watched, and I didn't have the privilege of seeing Lever, but. They seem kind of similar players. It, those type of players, they only come around once in a generation, don't they? And they do, yes. The, the, I think the best player I have seen and played against, and I played against him and with him, uh, in the latter part of his career was Hode, Lou Hode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to my mind, Hode and his best would be the best player I've seen. Mm. Uh, followed not far behind by the likes of Laver and Fedra and Co. Obviously, if you took them as they played then and put them up against Federer and the top players of today, today's players would win handily because mm. the game has come on yeah. like every other sport. It's much more powerful, the players are even faster. Same applies in athletics, yeah. whether it's 100 meters or the high jump or the long jump. Yeah. The, sp the sport has grown and it's a combination of professionalism, uh, looking after your body, looking after what you eat. Uh, the equipment that you use uh, so that that would be a, a very unf unfair thing to do to sort of look at films of yeah. how Hode played when he won Wimbledon a couple of times and how Federer played when he's won his Wimbledon you could say well there would be no contest and it wouldn't it's just that I know that if Hode and Laver and Co grew up today in today's environment with all the advantages that it's given to players today they would be the equal, if not the better, of today's players. Mm. One of the great dif differences, of course, between players then and players today was that many more of the surfaces then were on grass and therefore much faster. So players played a lot more of the serve volley type game. Mm. The players of my generation and before were far better volleyers than the players today. Players today yeah. are far better off the ground but lacked the competency on the volley that players of, of our generation had. Mm. And, and there, you, you you talked about the kind of change in tennis through the years, um, comparing the game to when Labour played to now and the kind of progression. Do you, is there a point in tennis over the last few decades which has been pivotal in changing the game for you? Obviously in the 80s, um, the likes of John McEnroe and Jimmy Connors, they really kind of the crowd on their side and really got people into tennis um, do, do you see that as much in the game now or do you see any pivotal moments uh, that you think stand out in the history of tennis well I think I think the big change came um, firstly in, when tennis became open in 68 it was thrown open everybody then could play so the winning of the majors was really the win the, the winning by the best in the world um, so that, that was important. And then the fact that uh, once professionalism took over and once television caught on to the uh, possible greater exposure of tennis, it made a huge difference, particularly in the States, where we sort of played intermittently. We not even bothered to play the US yeah. championships for years, but they made a determined effort to attract players. They chartered planes, flew people over just to play the American tournament. American Championship, yeah. today's US Open, to encourage people to go over. Once tennis became professional, 
who would put the money into the game but the Americans and it was there really that the game began to, to, to change in, in the 70s mm. uh, even prior to Connors and, and McEnroe but of course with Connors and McEnroe and players of that era the game got maximum exposure because it was then beginning to, mm -hmm. to, to, to gather moss and to gather interest and, uh, and appeal and prize money increased more and more players came into the game made it uh, therefore much more competitive and as a result the quality of the best players began to obviously improve as, as they were pushed to the fore and to even better player by the professional players around them. Yeah. Formation of the Association of Tennis Professionals, I was involved with that at its outset in the early 70s, that obviously made a huge difference as well the running of a professional tour, uh, the consideration for players at tournaments, where in the early days we were barely looked after at all, we had to fend for ourselves. With the, with the establishment of the ATP, the players were far better looked after. So all those factors, I think, helped to raise the profile and the standard of the sport. And, and just taking things back to your career uh, again, um, Obviously, you're hugely successful, you know, winning you know, 10 Grand Slam titles, uh, a mixture of obviously the men's doubles and mixed. Um, is, is there one highlight for you? And can you just tell me a bit about Wimbledon, what it was like to play on centre court for the people who haven't played on centre court? What was it like? I know it's changed down the years, but. It well, it, it's changed, and yet, you know, I'm, I'm just busy reading, as I do from time to time, a, a tennis book written by Helen Jacobs and describing the top woman of her era. These are people going back to Cezanne, Suzanne Longlin. Mm. And the, the, the feeling she describes of walking onto Wimbledon Centre Court or the US Championships, which were then played at uh, Forest Hills, is much the same, I'm sure, as it is today. It's, it's nerve-wracking. It's your, it's your great ambition yeah. to go on there, but it's the big stage, and I'm sure it's like an actor on Broadway or or in the West End in London, taking to the stage. It's a pretty nerve-wracking experience, and it's a matter of how you deal with those nerves. Sometimes they unsettle you, sometimes the opponent deals with it better, sometimes he's just a better player, you, you just never know. Mm. But undoubtedly, uh, the fact that you've overcome those nerves, and that as a result, in my case, being successful, uh, at, at times on the centre court, I've also lost in the centre court, mm. uh, is very, very meaningful and uh, a, a source of, of great pride. Mm. And obviously, if, throughout your you know, career, tennis career of, of a long longevity, um, you must have made some great fa friends in the game. You know, who would you, are there players you, people you still keep in touch with now? You know, who are your great friends and uh, that you still kind of communicate with and keep in contact Well, there are, I mean, I'm still uh, in touch at That's times yeah. with, with Bob Hewitt, my uh, former partner. Uh, people like Tom Ocker, um, the, the Hollander who was called the Flying Dutchman. Terrific player. He played on the same uh, uh, team tennis team that I did in, in America, San Francisco. I played five years of team tennis, which during those five years kept us out of tournaments yeah. other than Wimbledon from uh, April until virtually until after the US Open so we missed a whole lot of tournaments and uh, also when Tom Ocker first came to South Africa in many ways I sort of looked after him, befriended him and uh, it's an enduring friendship uh, Cliff Ritchie, an American number one mm. who's just brought out uh, a book last year uh, talking about his depression. Uh, it comes from a great tennis family. His sister Nancy is a member of the International Hall of Fame, a former American number one, and yet Cliff had these, as successful as he was, number one player in the world, he had these very depressing, not only moments, but months of depression, you know, ch chronic sort of uh, I suppose some people would call it sort of a bipolar condition, okay, a yeah. chronic depression, and he's brought out a book talking about his battles with depression, both as a player and 
after he'd retired as a player. He I'm still in, in touch with. And um, the establishment of clubs like the Last Eight Club, which Wimbledon started 25 years ago, and which every other major has followed. In other words, anybody getting to the last eight of the singles, or getting to the semi-finals or finals, oh, semi-finals of the doubles or finals of the mix, you become a member of the Last Eight Club. So that going to a place at, at Wimbledon, I work there, but even if I didn't work, I could go and as a member of the Last Eight Club, I would meet up with with old friends, uh, people like even even though I played with him, he's really from before my time. People like Neil Fraser, former Wimbledon champion, U.S. champ, often see in the in the last eight, and members from really all over the world uh, would come in. I think of Willem Bungert, who was a runner-up at Wimbledon, a German player, and members of the last eight club and these various majors is is a great uh, sort of mecca for for ex-players and, and for meeting up with old friends. And uh, just uh, two last final questions. Um, the first one, uh, I just wanted to ask a bit what you thought about the game now, um, the men's game specifically, um, and the top of it. Um, obviously Roger, is, we all know what he's done in his career. Um, his last slam was in 2010. He hasn't got one since, but you know, he played that fantastic match, which I think you commentated on against Djokovic at the French. Yeah. Uh, the first part of the question, do you see him winning more majors? Will he come back again? And, and what, what do you think of the rise of Djokovic? And have you ever seen anything like that in the game yourself? Or? Well, Fedra, I was wrong about Fedra because judging from past experience and, and seeing players like McEnroe won three t three majors in one year, never winning another major. Labour won his Grand Slam, second Grand Slam, four majors in one year in 69, never won another major. Mm. And based on that, even though I recognise Federer's talent, and I'm pleased to say I was probably one of the first to recognise it because we used to commentate in Baal, go to Baal and do the tournament, and Federer as a young youngster started playing there and I could see the possibility in him and declared it and uh, believe I'm responsible for calling him the, the Federal Express mm. as opposed <laughs> to Federal Express. <laughs> so I, was, I thought that he would not win a, uh, another major. He confounded me by winning the Australian. Um, so I'm, he's, he's, al he's already contradicted me by, by winning a major and he's amazed me because he's just maintained this ambition to continue to do well where in the past it's not for lack of youth it's not for lack of of uh, talent that prevented McEnroe, Laver and so many others from winning further majors it's just something at the back of the mind that tells the player he's just done so remarkably well he may still be supremely fit, but they just l perhaps lacks that slight little bit of ambition that they had before that prevents them from going that extra yard, which is necessary always to beat opponents who are out there to, to beat you and to win majors for themselves. Federer's confounded me, and uh, who knows? I still don't think he's going to win yet another major. Mm. But I would be very pleased if he did, mm. uh, because he is that talented and he keeps reminding us of just how amazingly ambitious he is. As for Djokovic, mm. he astounded me this year with his with the progress. It just uh, seemed to stem from that Davis Cup win of theirs yeah. Yeah. and the rediscovery of his serve, because he had lost his serve. After he won his Australian major, he switched rackets. And it seemed to me that the new racket didn't suit him. He changed his service action. He began to bowl the service action. And where in the past, his best serve, particularly when he won the Australian, having to save break points or important points was a big serve out wide to the backhand. He lost that serve altogether. He couldn't serve it. And I even said to his coach, Marion Vida, that until he rediscovered that, he was not going to win another major. 
he did discover it, rediscover it. It must have been, I didn't see the Davis Cup final. Mm. He must have used it then, I don't know. But certainly during the Australian, the beginning of this year, he used it. Yeah. And from then he's just gone from strength to amazing strength. Not with any anything particularly new other than desire, ambition, keeping his head down, keeping on, keeping on. Where in the past perhaps he just lacked that extra bit of courage and uh, strength and ambition used to find excuses to drop out of matches now he's far less inclined to do that and it's just been an amazing run mm. uh, and just finally through because i really appreciate your time with me here um you've made the transition we briefly touched on it earlier from you know the sportsman uh, to the commentary box if you like into into broadcasting um you know how much do you enjoy it how much do you get out from that and and is there a commentary moment or a moment since over the last 15 years or so you've been commentating that stands out for you as a highlight? Is it, and maybe particularly at Wimbledon, what, what's it like covering the British players, the kind of rise of Tim Henman? And it looked like he would win it in 2001, the Wimbledon, and then he, now, now Murray. What, what, what's it like? Well, you know, I, f I feel <clears throat> blessed really that I've been able to continue and to, and to keep at it for quite as long as I have. Uh, but I think experience and the fact that I can relate to players going back to Gonzalez and Hode and Rosen and all these people I think in many ways adds a little bit to, to a commentator's repertoire um, as for supreme moments in, in, in my commentating career I suppose early days of Becker winning, winning at Wimbledon seeing this a uh, young guy of, of 17 come through and particularly playing a fellow South African named Kevin Curran who I obviously knew yeah, and had yeah. played against uh, so they, they stand out working with people like Max Robinson at, at Wimbledon who I used to listen to as a kid with Fred Perry mm. so moments like that and then to uh, Federer's rise sort of having seen him as a youngster knowing his mother particularly well because she's a South African as I am knowing his father meeting them in, in Baal and getting to know the family. Uh, Fedra's first success at Wimbledon was to me uh, a real treat, so much so that uh, the the uh, notes that I had and, and that I had uh, whilst commentating on Fedra's final, I had framed in Wimbledon colours and, and gave gave to the family, gave to oh, the right. Fedra family. <laughs> so that was that was pretty special for me. Oh, great.